uh, this, I could not think of something better to discuss than the very teachings of the man we worship, Jesus Christ. Um, and we get to discuss that today. I absolutely love that we get to jump through and learn in Jesus' school. I know a lot of these truths are things that we've learned since we were little and we were young, and so I believe the hope for today is to have that treasure, uh, that truth that may, ha- may be in there and probably is, but can be resurfaced, and we can meditate on that, think on that, and let the Holy Spirit use that and stir that inside of us uh, to live the kingdom way. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6 today, verses 19 and 20, and we'll look at some other passages as well, but that's where we'll start here today. Matthew 6, of course, uh, takes place still in the Sermon of the Mount, and you've got these incredible list of teachings that Jesus has while in the Sermon of the Mount. No doubt in this time, Jesus is speaking to many hurting families. He's speaking to... um, you know, those that are farmers, those that are day laborers, those that have been oppressed by Rome. And these people are sick and tired of being mocked and oppressed and pushed into poverty because of taxes. And they're looking for a rescuer. We talked about that uh, in worship a little bit today, a rescuer. Many years ago, people of Israel were in bondage and in slavery and were looking for a rescuer. And so uh, the Lord, God, sent them a rescuer by the name of Moses. Moses came, and Moses was the rescuer for them. Of course, God rescued them, but we understand. Moses led them, and Moses gave them a law and allowed them to be the example to all the other nations how to live the kingdom way. Well, Jesus came, and of course, the people are now, again, looking for a rescuer, Here comes Jesus, the rescuer, the ultimate rescuer, better than Moses. And he comes and reiterates and then fulfills the law and shows us even deeper what it means to live the kingdom way. And that's what we'll look at here today. In in the midst of his teaching, he gives his, his kingdom come and will be done lesson in truth. Oh, it's so good. We go back to often. How can his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Through the followers of Yahweh, with changed hearts, living the kingdom way. Let's look at our text this morning. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. But fortunately, we have... Clay to help us out, in case anybody does come in and steal. We know a police officer. All right. Uh, But he says, store up your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Father, as we take this time, would you allow the truth in your word, the truth that you taught many years ago that is ever so relevant today to us, would you stir in our heart this truth? Would you bring it to the surface, and would you let us walk out your kingdom way of living and understand and grab a hold of this truth of storing up treasures in heaven. Amen. Luke chapter 12, verse 33, uh, first part says this, Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail. Uh, In other words, a good uh, Dustin analogy would be instead of spending all all that money on those brand new pair of white tennis shoes that you don't want to go near the kids because they're going to step on and scuff, okay? Instead, store up treasures in heaven (laughs) because eventually the shoes are going to get ruined, all right? The the valuables are going to become less valuable, Uh, but we have the opportunity to store up treasures in heaven that never lose their value and are greater than any treasure we could possess here on earth. Let's look at this parable that Jesus said in Luke 12. Uh, Jesus has the best statements, the best stories, and the most radical things to say, uh, and I love it. And we don't shy away from that here. But let's look at this parable he tells. He says, take care. 
and be on guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And that's a pretty good place to be. <laughs> all right, we can all say, amen. The Lord is blessing. All right, so let's look what he does with the Lord's blessing. And he says, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build bigger or larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, I love that. And I say to myself, self, uh, he says, but I, I say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. On the surface, we look at this and say, now, wait a minute. Doesn't seem like such a bad idea. I mean, hey, Lord's blessing, store it up, retire early. Amen. You know, the Lord does not share that view. <laughs> In fact, the Lord has quite the opposite. He says, uh, but God said to him, fool, Oof. this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Wow. Wow. The Lord blesses, keeps it all for himself, and the Lord says, fool, that is not the kingdom way. Have you ever said this in your home? That is not how we do things here, right? I've had many conversations with my children, uh, you know, whichever one it may be at the time. Uh, uh, no, no, no. That is not the Anaya way, okay? We don't do that. And the beautiful thing is, I'm not related to any Anayas, so they have no idea what the Anaya way is because I'm making it up as I go. And uh, so I say, that is not the Anaya way. We do not do that in this home, right? And here's this man saying, I'm going to take all this that the Lord is blessing, and I'm going to store it up and keep it for myself and retire early. And God says, that is not the kingdom way. That is not how we do things. Before we look at what Jesus is saying, let's take a minute. And let's think about what is Jesus not saying in this moment, okay? Jesus is not saying that it is wrong to have bank accounts, life insurance policies, things of that nature. Jesus is not saying it's wrong to have money. Jesus is not saying it's wrong to have a lot of money. Jesus is not saying it is wrong to enjoy the blessings that he has given us. How can you be so sure Jesus is not saying that? I'm so glad you asked. Deuteronomy 8, verse 18 says, It is he who gives you power to get wealth. 1 Timothy 6, 17, God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Paul says this in Philippians. He says, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. See, Paul lived in times of plenty. Paul lived in times of abundance. And there was nothing wrong with Paul living in those moments, right? He tells us, then we have the famous verse afterwards, right? Proverbs 20 verse 21 tells us, precious treasure and oil are in a wise man's dwelling, but a foolish man devours it, right? The wise man he has is in his dwelling. Why? Because he saved it. The foolish man gets it and spends it as quick as he can, okay? Proverbs 22 verse 4, the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. So we can see here Jesus is not saying those statements that we said before, right? That all of these things are wrong. No, 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 no. Uh, I like John Wesley's three principles regarding money. And John Wesley has this. Number one, he says, earn as much as you can. 
I'm with you, John. Save as much as you can. All right, John, we're doing good. Number three, in order to give to God as much as you can. What a philosophy. Earn as much, save as much, so you can give as much as you can. Well, let's focus on what is Jesus saying? What is Jesus saying? Well, I believe he's speaking to us about several things. First of all, he is speaking to us about eternal investments. Eternal investments. What is an investment? An investment is an act of devoting time, effort, resources, or energy to our particular undertaking with the expectation of a worthwhile result, right? So with the expectation of a worthwhile result. Scripture tells us that the things we do on earth, they affect our rewards in heaven. So we make these eternal investments every day in our lives that will affect our life and our time, eternity in heaven. What do eternal investments look like? Well, they look like, on this side of things, sacrifice. That's what eternal investments look like. It has been said, to get the most out of this life, we've got to be intentional about the making the most of the next one. Look at what Jesus says here in Luke 12, 33. He says, sell your possessions and give to the needy. And we read this earlier, but provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. Matthew 10, 42, he says this, and if you have given even a cup of cold water to one of the least of my followers, you will surely be rewarded. Well, that's a pretty good promise right there. A cup of cold water. I can do that. I can, I'm going to go around this week giving cups of cold water. <laughs> Lord Jesus, uh, put it to my account. Think of it like this. At work, we have, uh, I'm an uh, insurance sales agent, licensed sales agent, and uh, going through my, my uh, mantra that I say every time, but a licensed sales agent, and we have something at our company, I work for a company called Select Quote. We have something called The Square. The Square is this platform. Josh and I were talking about this not too long ago. The Square is this platform where we can earn points for things, and whether it be spiffs or completing you know, this objective or goal, or sometimes just other things. The manager looks and says, man, you've been doing a great job, or I noticed this. And what they do is they put points onto the square. And so you log into your square account and you look, oh man, that's awesome. I got, you know, 100 square points. The best thing about the square points is you take those and you turn those into gift cards. Yes. A little bit different form of currency. And so we have a guy that I work with. His name is Devon. We all call him D. And D is the man. D is a good guy. He is just an upright guy. And I love working with D. Let's say D is working with uh, this uh, elderly lady over the phone. Her name, we're going to call her Edith. And that uh, seems like a good name. Uh, so D is working with Edith and going through and taking the time, plugging in all 22 of her prescriptions that she's taking uh, that she got thanks to St. Paul. De no, uh, but she got all of these prescriptions and he's taking the time to plug them in. She, he plugs in, D does, all 13 of Edith's doctors and all the time that that takes. And it is an hour later, and finally, he has all the information plugged in, and he can now make a recommendation of a plan to sell her and realizes the plans that we have are just not quite as good as the one she has. But, but, think about Miss Edith she doesn't know a lot about insurance. She would be an easy candidate to sell a plan because she doesn't know even what she has. She doesn't know much about her plan. And so what an easy moment it is for Dee, who's a good salesman, to say, now I've got this plan over here, Miss Edith, and let me tell you about it. But instead, Dee says, Miss Edith, let me, just, let me just be straight up with you here. The plan you have is a great option, 
And I could sell you a plan, but I'll be honest, it'd give you less benefits. It wouldn't be as good as coverage as you have now. I wouldn't do it, and I'd stay with what you have. Oh, and Edith would say, oh, you're such a sweet young man, D. Thank you so much, and hang up. And our manager, whose name is Andrew, right, he'd say, hey, message D, hey, I want to talk to you right after this call. So boom, D, okay, all right, ends the call, talks to Andrew. Now, D had just used an hour of his day and lost the sale and lost the time <laughs> to make other sales during that time, right? Sacrificed it and said, uh, I'm gonna, not going to do this. And Andrew says, D, that's exactly what we are looking for here at our company. We need our company to have a good reputation, and you just helped give our, gave our company a good reputation. You could have sold that lady easily, but it would not have been in her best interest. D, I'm throwing up 150 square points for you. All right, let's go. What happened? Well, D lost out on time. He doesn't get that time back. He lost out on that sale. He doesn't get that sale back. But you know what he did get? He got something credited to his account in a different way. You see, when we do our deeds here on earth, sometimes it looks like sacrifice. We spend money. We spend time. We, we do these things and we give of ourselves and it looks like sacrifice because oftentimes on this side, we, we don't get it back. But what happens is we get it credited to our account in heaven. Jesus says this, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, um, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you? Or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Whew, what a perspective. What a perspective. The way God sees things. He says, yeah, you did it to them. And you thought nobody was looking or watching, but you were actually doing that unto me. Wow. Now, poses the question, how can we invest in eternity? How can we store up treasures in heaven? I think an easy answer would be to give sacrificially and generously. To give sacrificially and generously. There were two men uh, talking from the same church and they were having a building project and one man said to his friend, he said, you know, I'm just in a spot right now I could give $1,000 to the building right now and wouldn't even feel it. And his friend looked at him and said, well, why don't you give two or 3000 and feel it, <laughs> right? Uh, giving sacrificially, right? We can feel it sometimes. Can you talk about sacrificial giving and not talk about the widow with the two mites? Uh, I mean, what a story. And the two mites, that's a good King James word. I, hearing that growing up, you're always like, with the two mites, that sounds like, Sounds like something you don't want. Like, it sounds like, I don't know, sounds like, like lice or fleas or something, you know? Like, yeah, of course she gave it away. Why would she not? Why would she want to keep that, you know? No, no, no. Uh, but the money. So Jesus here, Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. 
What a moment of sacrificial giving. Giving sacrificially and generously. And we see that throughout scripture, right? We see the story of Hannah say, Lord, would you give me a son and I will give him back to you. And the Lord blesses and Hannah follows through and gives her son back, right? We think of the story of Abraham and Isaac, right? The promised son, I want him back. Well, Lord, he was yours to begin with. Here he is. And we think about the widow giving her food to Elijah. All of these different stories in scripture. So we ask another question. Okay, so how can we invest in the kingdom? How can we invest in eternity? We give sacrificially and we give generously. Jesus makes, uh, he doesn't shy away from that. He says, your money, give it to the poor, right? He, may, he does not shy away from that at all. But we ask the question, is the only way that we can store up treasures in heaven by giving money? Is that the only way? By that I have to give generously and sacrificially? Okay. We would say, no. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13 says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their deeds will follow them. Their deeds will follow them. Right? So not just, maybe it is an act of giving, but maybe it's an act of something else as well. Maybe it's giving of something else. You know, we have things that we can also give that aren't just money. We have our time. Our time is so valuable and so precious. Um, and sometimes, <laughs> you know, we, we hold on to that too closely, don't we? Uh, have you ever found yourself like this? You're at the grocery store and you just, you want to get in and out and you're going and you can't get in this aisle because there's two people blocking it and they're going so slow and you're just, I just want to get around so fast. Like, where do I have to go? That is so important at that moment, you know? But no, my time, it is so precious to me, right? But the things we have are so precious. Our time, our resources, or the talents, the gifts that God has given you. And we use that for his purposes and for him. You know, I think of when we moved here. Uh, we moved from a church in North Carolina, running 900 plus, to a church in Westchester, running 50 minus. And uh, so, and it was beautiful. Hallelujah. One of the best decisions of our life. And I mean that. And um, as we, we were going through this transitional time, we, we come here, and uh, we had more people uh, help us unpack here than we did pack there. And that is not in any way, shape, or form an indictment on them. What it is, is a, uh, um, the word's escaping me, <laughs> a testament to the people here. People who didn't really know us, right? Josh did, but uh, the people who didn't really know us were willing to come and do that. They came and were so helpful. We didn't need, you know, necessarily people to come and uh, just pour money at us. What we needed was love. What we needed was to see the kingdom way demonstrated. And that's what happened. Gabriella, my wife and I, we just, we just stood there. Honestly, just in awe of people who, who don't know us. You don't even know me. And we watched as Jared and Josh used their resources, aka muscles, to bring in this heavy old piano that I have to keep uh, from the truck, up the stairs, down the ledge, up the ledge, into the spot. We watched as uh, Pastor Jared used his talents to check out our HVAC system. And we would expect nothing less. We watched as our friends, the Vaprazan, sat there and not only brought our table in, but then just sat down and started assembling the table, putting it together. We watched as Candace long took paper towels and rags and wiped out our cabinets. 
And honestly, it was a little uncomfortable for us. We weren't used to that. And it was a little tough receiving it. It would have been better if they just said, here's a bunch of money. (laughs) Okay, great. I don't have to sit and receive that as long. Um, But what did they do? They showed the kingdom way. They invested time out of their day. And we did. We also got other gifts. Uh, I don't know if I'm thankful or unthankful that Rusty sent us a uh, DoorDash gift card. It has gotten me on a deep, dark trail of door dashing. Uh, but we got to experience the kingdom way from the followers of Jesus. 1 Peter 4, 7 through 10 says this, The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sins. Cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. God has given each of you a gift from this great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Investing in eternity, does it consist of giving money? Absolutely it does, and I don't want to shy away from that. I think uh, we can use that bubbling up to the surface. But it does also involve giving in other ways. right? I think of taking time out of your day to be in a prayer room or a Rafa room to pray for and intercede for, to teach and train people who you don't know, who may say thank you in the moment, but you're probably not going to receive an earthly reward for that. That's investing in eternity. I think of uh, jumping on a Prophecy Zoom, I've already been there, I've already learned this, but you know what, I'm going to go and I'm going to help others that may be learning this for the first time. And yeah, I'm going to take some time out of my day to do that. You know, I I have a talent, Um, the Lord has given me, I can paint, I can draw, Justin, and uh, you know what, I'm going to use that. And I'm going to allow the Lord to bring fruit because of that because of my willingness to invest in eternity with what the Lord has given me. I'm going to serve tirelessly and not ask for thanks. All of those look like investing in eternity. But you know what else the Lord speaks to us about? Lastly, he speaks to us about a kingdom mindset. So investing into eternity, but he gives us the mindset to do it. What does he say? Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. But seek first the kingdom of God. What does a kingdom mindset look like? It looks like surrender. Absolute, complete surrender. And that is the kingdom way. The kingdom way is a life of sacrifice and a life of ultimate surrender. I could not possibly word it better. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 4. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, 
this next phrase. And when Christ, who is your life? What does my life consist of? What does it not consist of? And Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world. You will share in all his glory. Jesus made many radical statements when talking about the kingdom way. He says this, So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. If I'm renouncing something, I am formally declaring one's abandonment of a claim, right, or possession. So here, here's the kingdom mindset, it of surrender, right? Here is this kingdom mindset to have. All that I have, all that I have is from him. It is all from the Lord. My money, it's from him. My time, it's from him. My health, my abilities, my gifts, my talents, all of it is from him. Therefore, all of it is his and is to be used for his purposes. All of it is his. That is the kingdom mindset. Everything I have isn't actually mine. Everything I have is actually his. And when we come into this world with that mindset, it can look a little different. People may not understand, but it's because it's the kingdom mindset. It's not the mindset of this culture and of this world. Kingdom mindset says, no, it's how could you give that? How could you spend three hours with this person that you don't know and will never see again? Oh, no, no, you don't understand. That's, that's not my time to give. That's his time that he gave me. And I'm just using it for his purposes. Think about this. Uh, Ryan, let's say you take Logan to a basketball game. And you give Logan $10 before you walk in and say, Logan, here's 10 bucks. You know, during halftime, you can go, you know, and grab some stuff, grab some snacks and all that. Okay, cool. So halftime approaches and you look at Logan and say, oh, hey, Logan, that $10 I gave you while you were up grabbing stuff. Can you grab me a hot dog? I saw this had hot dogs on the way in. Uh, it looks like they were $1.50. Can you grab that? Logan says, oh, dad, here's the thing. On the way in, I saw that they had Dippin' Dots. And I saw that they had popcorn. And honestly, those chicken tenders looked so good. So to be honest with you, Dad, I don't actually have the money to do that. Like, I can't do that because it's already spoken for. Like, I've already kind of planned out what I'm doing with that $10. Um, and actually, it might even be a little bit more, Dad. Can I borrow a little bit more? I know you gave me 10. Thank you. But could I have a little bit extra? Ryan, who's a good man, would look at his son. Get knocked out. No. Uh, he, he said, wait a minute. I gave you that money. Right? Oof. How many times has the Lord said, um, hey, can you pray with me about this person? I'm putting this person on your heart. Can you spend 45 minutes in prayer for this person right now? Oh, Lord, you know I would. In fact, I, I did kind of do that on Wednesday because we intercede on Wednesdays, Lord. Oh, but Lord, it's Friday evening. And I, I have this planned, Lord. I really would, but the time you have given me it's already spoken for. Ooh. I've repented of that this week. I want you to help out this family, and I want you to give this to them. You see, Lord, if I do that, though, I'm not going to be able to do this, which is what I had really been planning on doing. Mm. Mm. The kingdom mindset says, yeah, Lord, you want me to pray for 45 minutes for this person? Yeah. That's your time you gave me. That's yours. So I'd be glad. Oh, I'd be glad to give it back to you. 
Mm, the things that will happen because of that. We live life, as Romans 12 says, as a living sacrifice. Jesus speaks to us about other things, the Father's assurance, right? Lest we think, if I, if I give too much, uh, what am I going to have for me and for my family? Oh, there's a balance, but more than that, there is a Father who says, I've got you. It's okay. I love this. In, in uh, 2 Corinthians 9, of course, he talks about a cheerful giver. He says, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. <laughs> kind of takes that out of the way, doesn't it? Uh, we have this promise from God. He's going to give you everything you need and more so you can help others. Okay. <laughs> Guess I should do it. He gives us a good heart evaluation in Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there's your heart also. How am I doing at this? Well, on the giving and financial side, it's kind of an easy way to check where your heart is on this. Well, let's see where I'm spending my money. Let's see where I'm spending all of my time. And then, of course, he talks about the ripple effect, right? Paul uh, talks about this in 2 Corinthians later. He says, your giving, your, your sacrifice and giving of this money to these believers, you know what it did? He said it, it met the needs of the believers, and they expressed thanks to God. Glory was given to God. It proved that you were obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So many ripple effects happen when we invest in eternity. And then, of course, he talks to us about heavenly rewards. Rusty, if you'll come on this way. Life, life is simply a series of investments made over time, every day, every day. It's not a matter of, am I investing? It is a matter of, what am I investing in today? I think about Corrie ten Boom. I read her book a little while ago, The Hiding Place, Corrie ten Boom, uh, after the Nazis in Germany took over her homeland, decided she was going to live a life of sacrifice for people she didn't really know and wasn't related to. And she said, I am going to live my life for these people. I'm going to sacrifice it. Oh, and she sacrificed much. But this is a prayer that she prayed. Lord, she said, I offer myself for your people in any way, any place, any time. A life of surrender and a life of sacrifice. Corrie ten Boom, she lived the kingdom way. Pastor Jared did the work for me last week on this next slide. Jim Elliott, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. I'll mention these three things. What do I do with this truth, and how do I apply this today? Number one, wisely steward what God has given us with thanksgiving. Number two, pray this regularly. Jesus, teach me how to give my resources eternal value. Number three, Look for ways to live out the kingdom way.